shares a Netflix account with Sean McVay. Also, Williams a Studio. Let's count the unwritten rules broken. Seven! He, Let's he go around the horn. Then it's Wayland's national it. hero. Sharing your Netflix down. password with people. YouTube hit Illegal. running bases. Something. NFL wall. coaching spree. Let's go around the horn with the news of the day. Cleveland Browns promoting and hiring Freddie Kitchens. He was their running backs coach to start the year. Offensive coordinator to end it. Denver Broncos making a defensive hire. Is that still allowed in the NFL? Vic Fangio after the superb defensive season the Bears had. And last night after we signed off here, Bruce Arians to Tampa. The game is to find the next Sean McVay. Could this young Bruce Arians guy be the next McVay? <laughs> Hello. Let's Whoa. start with Kitchens and the Browns Woo. national panel. Is eight games is OC with Baker enough to get him the promotion? Clinton Yates, first to you. I think absolutely. I mean, we can go through all the different numbers. Everything was up in the eight games that he coached. Completions percentage, yards per game, touchdowns per game, the sacks were down, attempts per completion, as well as points per game. And hello, again, they won five more games. This is not just about those numbers, in my opinion. I feel, though, the main thing they've got to deal with is whether or not Baker Mayfield actually likes this guy, which is obviously a big deal in terms of how he's dealt with coaches on the way out. If Mayfield is in, you know, is in cahoots with him as far as a strategy standpoint is concerned and the numbers are up, I don't see any Well, clearly that's numbers. something they have information on whether he and Mayfield get along. I mean, they're making that decision knowing what, what the history is here. Israel Gutierrez, Kitchens, promotion after eight games as OC. Well, this is the great thing about the position the Browns are in. If Kitchens ends up being the coach who leads them to a Super Bowl however many years down the road, then fantastic, you nailed this hire. But really, the most important part here is developing Baker Mayfield and developing that offense. And as Clinton mentioned, it's about whether he's comfortable in it. And he obviously didn't have, didn't vie with Hugh Jackson. He's obviously a very brash young man, is, is going to have his, his voice heard, whether it be on, with this coach or any other coach. So if you get a guy in Freddie Kitchens who's been with him for these eight games and he's, you know, succeeded obviously under him, then I think that's a great get. It's not really a lot of pressure to, to, to have hired the next Super Bowl winning coach of the Cleveland Brown or the first. Hmm. <laughs> Speaking of brash, Sarah Spain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think even with the current Browns who are looking up, you still have to ask yourself with every decision they make, have they just Brownsed it? And if they hadn't <laughs> gone with Kitchens and they'd gone looking for somebody else, even though the proof is right in front of them that he was able to turn around the team, that he works well with Baker Mayfield, that the offensive stats went up, that they are averaging more yards per offensive uh, play than anybody in years and years, then you would say, oh my God, they Brownsed it. Why did they go find someone else? It's right in front of them. <laughs> so the hope is that the proof that they've already seen from Kitchens proves over the course of multiple seasons. So the proof is in the kitchens, is what you're saying. Bill Plasky, how about right. you? I I'm don't really like it. Teams, uh, teams really don't. I don't know how smart it is to <laughs> promote a coordinator from within to be a head coach. Everyone looks at him one way. Suddenly now they're looking at him a different way. A lot, most teams won't do this because of this. It's a dangerous thing. I'd have gone for somebody like Kevin Stefanski, the coordinator in Minnesota. Wait, wait, what are you saying here? Look, Promoting from within is a, sh is a show of weakness or a show of lack of imagination? Yeah, no, it's, it's, no, no it's, it's a show that a lot of times teams, very few teams do this. And, and, and often it doesn't work. Because you have, again, everybody looks at him like the offensive coordinator is everybody's buddy. Now he's got to be the head coach. It's a different role. You don't see this a lot. That's why teams go outside, bring someone else in. I think it's a big risk. Oh, that's interesting to me. Because uh, do they even see him as an offensive coordinator? He started the year as the running backs <laughs> coach. Gutierrez back in. Right. Everybody yeah, a lot of teams, their players themselves will, will ask for a promotion for, for a, a coordinator of some sort. It's, it, within the organization, it's not necessarily a bad idea. And again, as Tony mentioned, this is an eight-game situation as the offensive coordinator. He was the running backs coach before that. He's had different positions with different organizations. Somebody to give him a chance. Hey, this is going to be an entirely different animal than just hiring. That's from Cleveland. Let's talk about an entirely different animal. Let's talk about the Denver Broncos here. Sarah, you know Fangio as well as anybody here. Good move for the Broncos to go with a defense defensive-minded head coach in 2019? Well, first I'd like to say that I'm absolutely heartbroken that my Bears lost Fangio because I wanted to see what they could put together with another season. They were ahead of the game uh, this year. I thought they outperformed expectations. So I wanted him to stick around and see what he could do with this defense. It's so hard to keep defenses effective year after year, even when personnel remains the same. As far as the Broncos go, I think Fangio has proved himself to be incredibly creative on the defensive side. He's a guy that's really well-respected. He's a little bit oppo from the Sean McVay exactly. lookalikes everybody else is going for. My only concern here is 
that the obvious problem in Denver has been the quarterback for so many years in a row that if you go out and get a defensive guy, are you at least surrounding him with the right kind of people that are going to be able to not only spot talent at the quarterback position, but foster it from a different part of that staff? That's the key. And then they can use him defensively and as the man who's leading everybody in the way he needs Israel to be. Israel Gutierrez on defense in 2019? Yeah, I mean, I could, if you're a Broncos fan, I could be sold on the idea of bringing in Fangio and sort of winning with the same formula as before, which included a Peyton Manning who was not, you know, the typical Peyton Manning. But if I were John Elway, I'd want to take a little bit of that pressure off of myself then, right? Because he's the one receiving all the criticism about getting quarterbacks wrong and that offense not working when he should be the guy who knows, you know, what he's doing in that scenario. And yet he's still allowing this situation to be put on him if the offense struggles or if Keenum it doesn't uh, really... Uh, worth that paycheck. So it is interesting what's going on here. But Fangio, in terms of a sales pitch, in terms of a head coach, even in today's NFL, I think it's fine. Yeah, I don't mind the Fangio pick. I mean, this shows to me that Elway's a little bit desperate in terms of trying to find some sort of leadership in that locker room because he can't find it at the quarterback position. But they're bringing in Kubiak as the offensive coordinator who did great down there in Houston. So for me, that sort of shores up what that is on the other side of the ball. And I don't have a problem with that. If you're going to bring a known guy in to actually run the offense and do something new on the defensive side, I think it's actually kind of smart from Elway for once. No, you know what? I don't like this again. Again, Sarah made the point. The Broncos need offense. They need a quarterback whisperer. They need somebody to help them offensively. They've got a great defense already. And, and, and Clinton, you mentioned bringing Kubiak in. Well, he was great several years ago. Is he up? And you know, Again, he, he's been in the organization now for several years. The quarterbacks haven't gotten any better. I would have gone offensive here, offensive here all the way. I'm just really surprised they went to you – know, Fangio is a great guy and a great defensive coordinator. Not really a head coach candidate for me, for the okay, Broncos. And now Bruce Arians here in Tampa. They say he's going to help Jameis the way he did with Big Ben and with Peyton Manning in the past. Is that a fair expectation, Bill Plaschke? Yes. Now, they hit this one right. The Bucks hit a home run here. Hey. He's, he has a credibility. You need someone with credibility that Winston will listen to. This guy's got two Super Bowl rings. He's worked with Big Ben. He's worked with Peyton Manning. He's worked with Andrew Luck. He's worked with all the guys. And, and Winston has one year to get this right. This is the way to go. Arians will be great. You hit, hit it out of the park is what you say. Sarah, you agree? I yeah, I think on first glance it looks like that. The only issue is there were concerns that he got too close to Roethlisberger and that relationship ended up enabling and maybe didn't hold them accountable. I worry about that with Jameis Winston, but at least you know that if it doesn't work with Winston with Arians, then you move on and it can't be Who about the coach. This is all about what you think about Jameis Winston. If you think that the early part of his career hasn't been good enough for, what, for his reasons, for his fault, then there's not really a whole lot that Arians can do. I think there's a lot to fix there with Jameis. You fix the turnovers. He's got everything else you really but want in a quarterback. I say it all the time, quarterback is the worst coach position in this league. However, I think Byron Leftwich, former quarterback in this league, who was the play caller and the offensive coordinator and a former quarterback's coach, is actually going to do well. So you say that, and, and you've said that before, but now you say it with a pencil, which really means something to me. What is the worst coach position <laughs> yes. in this league, if I can ask you that, Clinton Yates? It's quarterbacks. <laughs> and what is the best oh, coach it's, position it's in this kicker. league? It's kicker. It's special team. <laughs> I'm going to say kicker. Yeah, kicker. And I, I was, you know I was looking yeah, to say kicker. It, but somebody with a pencil. <laughs> okay, now we have a better idea of how the league will look next year. Here's how it'll look. 32 head coaching positions, 29 currently filled, two African-American coaches. Arizona and Cliff Kingsbury, where the press release came out and said, friend of Sean McVay. Incredible. That was the joke before. And then it played out in real time. And then, of course, it disappeared from the press release. But we have a league, 6% African-American coaches. That is 70% African-American players. Bill, how does that strike you? Not very good. The Rooney rule is obviously not working. I think it all, all goes to ownership and leadership. How many African-American owners are in the NFL? Zero. How many African-American general managers? Not many. And I think in the pipeline then, how many, everybody wants a Sean McVay clone now. How many African-Americans are being given the chance to become a Sean McVay clone? Not many. I still think we, if the whole thing reverts to, I think, a subconscious of, uh, you know, a stereotyping. And I, and, and I think it's trouble. The league needs to do something about it. I don't know what they do. I don't know how they change human nature, but it's, it's not good. Yates, it's not how good does it look. strike you? Just, just the fact of those yeah. numbers. The facts of the numbers are very striking as scary because think about it this way. It's not just about who's at the top in terms of head coaching. It's about what happens at the position coaches situation as well. So there were, you know, of the 32 running backs coaches in 2018 in the NFL, three of them happen to be white and one of them is now a head coach. Think about that. In terms of the different ways that black coaches are forced to try to get into the different markets for head coaching, most of them are told to go to the defensive side of the ball. The other part of them happen to be running back coaches because they don't end up getting to be quarterbacks coaches. And so you've got a situation where the 
pipeline, so to speak, is already marred to begin yes. with. So what, you ha what happens at the top, we don't know. So, are you seeing this, you know, this now as something that the Rooney Rule can't fix? I don't think that the Rooney Rule is really anything more than topical at this point. There's a much larger situation in terms of what Bill talked about. The way that we just perceive what black athletes can become once they become coaches is the issue here, not just what happens at the top. Gutierrez? Yeah, representation is just so important, right? When you have so many African-American players and they look up and they say, where are the black coaches? And that just doesn't motivate you to try to become one. Or maybe we're not promoting ourselves the right people. Where are we talking about the next Anthony Lynn or the next Mike Tomlin? So I'm in agreement with both of those guys, absolutely. And I don't think the Rooney Rule in place, as is, has any, any positive work going forward. I think it's pretty much needs to be revisited. Sarah. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think we've found a better Rooney rule, so it's better than nothing at all. You at least give those people a chance to go into those interviews and, and learn about the position and set themselves up for a better interview next time around, even if it's only being done because of the requirements of the Rooney rule. I think more importantly is when you look at the pipeline, those, those people are coming from lower. Every offensive coordinator, every defensive coordinator, they're usually starting at the high school level, at the collegiate level, and so that's where we need to really focus on making it less white. When you look at the numbers of coordinators in the NFL, the reason it's harder to uh, promote from there uh, for African Americans is that there aren't very many of them. And so, like Bill said, whether that's implicit bias that people aren't even aware of or whether it's a, a, a conscious decision not to hire that way, that's where it needs to change is in the pipeline. And Clinton Yates last week. 26 NFL teams haven't had a black offensive coordinator since 2013. That's from the Denver Post. Think about that number. Wow. All right, break time, which means a little bit of house cleaning here. We see the scores. Spain, Gutierrez, Yates, 10, Plasky, 8. Bill Plasky, last time you were on the show, though, I believe it was Friday, you were guaranteeing a ago. Bears win over the Eagles. You called it the most slam dunk lock. That's what you called it. Plasky this did. is what's going to happen Plasky to you right now. Well, a wave well, of no mutilation. You're going the wrong way. You're going so far back, microscopic. Mm. Fire cell next. Mm. Stay oh, away no. from my team, Bill. Around the Horn is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. If Horn coming to you from the Heineken River Deck at Pier 17. Yates, Gutierrez, Spain, 10. Plashki, what are you doing here? I, put, I told you to get over there. Get as far away as possible. I've got a great FaceTime. Can, Cheddar Bill. I, I've got a great FaceTime. Yeah? Well, you better give it to the people online because you're not doing it on TV. If the NBA lottery were to go down right now, the team with the most balls would be the Cleveland Cavaliers. Zion in Comic Sans. How does that sound for you guys? 30-10-5-4 mm. for Williamson versus Wake Forest last night. He was 3-4 from 3. What are you buying? What are you selling, Plash? More than a dunker? Did you get that last night? Yes, I'm buying that he wants to show people he is more than that. Because let's face it, in the NBA, if he wants to be the number one overall draft pick, a 6'8 dunker is going to need to be more. He needs to shoot. He needs to show he can play make. He needs to show he can rebound. I keep on putting you the wrong way. All right, there things. you go. Sarah Spain, yeah. how about you? <laughs> Uh, Listen, I think the people who matter who are coaches and NBA scouts, people at the next level, already know he's more than a dunker. When he says, I want to be known for more than that, I think he's preaching to people on the Internet who like the dunks because they make for good highlights. He didn't need to prove to us, but he sure did again last but night. But to Flasky's point, he's six foot eight. If you're six foot eight in the NBA, Israel Gutierrez, you better, do you better a lot learn of how to shoot the three. Yeah, I think he's actually saying that to everybody, even the NBA GMs as well, because it's all about desire and work ethic and whether he wants to be better. And so like Bill and Sarah said, he said he hates being called just a dunker, so he's going to do everything possible to prove that he is more than that. And that's what I want to hear. I want to hear a guy who's going to work, not necessarily all the, you know, the, the vertical leap and everything else. Yeah, and his court vision is, is tremendous, which is why their transition game is so good. It's not like, you know, there's something else happening there. He's part of the reason why they're so good on that attack. But the thing that I like about him most, he leads the team in steals per game. The guy plays defense and doesn't just block. Yeah, that's what it was last night, right? 30, 10, 5, 4 steals, and it was one block. We'll move on. Your midweek NFL shakedown. Let's talk quarterbacks. Patrick Mahomes' first career playoff start versus Andrew Luck, playing as well as anybody right now. Drew Brees and all the experience versus Nick Foles. And all the wizardry and conjuration. Rivers and Brady, postseason starts number 11 and 752, respectively. And Goff and Dak. Sarah, which quarterback do you think will have the biggest game this weekend? I'm tempted to go with Nick Foles because I once again was forced to bear witness to big Nick energy on Sunday. But I'm actually going to go with Andrew Luck, and here's why. 
As far as the game goes, the Chiefs are 31st against the pass. They've given up the most 20-plus yard pass plays in the league this year. Whether or not this results in a win, I think statistically, Andrew Luck is absolutely going to have a huge game. Gutierrez. Yeah, and you throw into the fact that the first-year quarterbacks uh, in the playoffs don't do very well. Last week, they all lost. And so, you think Patrick Mahomes, maybe he's not going to do so well against Andrew Luck and the Colts, especially the way the Colts are going. But, man, Sarah, I'm going to go ahead and say Nick Foles because I'm done trying to create reasons as to why he's going to lose. This guy just keeps winning in the playoffs. So, hey, he's going to do it. I'm still going to stick with Mahomes. I think the magic is still there. And again, the guy who should be getting considered for jobs who's not is Eric Bieniemy, who's running that offense, and he's the reason why the Chiefs have turned that around. And I think they're going to continue to do it. The offense interviewed him. Bill Plasky. Jared Goff. Goff is the guy you got to take for this thing. He's a great what? play action Shocking. passer. And the, and the Cowboys, the Cowboys, wow. 28th in the league against the play action. Don't you notice this pen here? It works for Clayton. Why is it not working for me, Tony? Well, I, I'm still on the Jared Goff. <laughs> well, let's go around the horn. I'm Plasky oh. taking Goff over the seven other quarterbacks this weekend. Sarah Spain? Oh, absolutely. Homer. Israel Gutierrez? Homer. <laughs> no. Lynn Yates? Thumbs down right. with a pencil. Sticking Plashke where oh, he came back I'm telling you, Jared Goff. We'll move on. Buy or sell three. Jalen Hurts news this afternoon. Putting himself in the transfer portal. That's the portal, which makes him available for contact with other teams, but doesn't lock him into transferring. He's got one year of eligibility left. Buy or sell Israel Gutierrez. I mean, I'm buying whatever team he goes to as being a heck of a lot better. This is going to be a find for them. I mean, this record, two losses as a starter, his experience, and he's all about winning, and he's going for one year to do nothing but win. I love it. So you're him. saying a heck of a lot better as in a better fit for him, a better chance for him to play, yada, yada, yada. Clinton Yates, how about you? Yeah, his dad talked to him up real big before this season about how he was going to be the biggest free agent in college football. We didn't see that happen, but I would like to see him go somewhere else where he can really move around and show his skills for the NFL because I still have a sour taste in my mouth about how that went down with him. Unlike everybody else, I will tell you where he should go. Oklahoma is the place for Jalen Hurts. That would yeah, be Murray something. be gone. He no can win right away there. He's a great transfer. It's smart of the kid to, go, to leave now. He, he did his time. Oklahoma. I, I, I love the suggestion, and I'm just – befuddled that you didn't say USC or UCLA. Sarah Spain, how about you? (laughs) They have quarterbacks. I'm just trying to understand the portal, and if I've got it right, it's like an outdoor bench, and Jalen Hurts is the bachelor, and Alabama is the girl he's currently talking to, but any other team can walk up and say, can I steal you for a minute? And then he has to go with them, and he doesn't get to make a choice. I think that's the best approach for him, and I think he should absolutely ditch the girl he's talking to, Mm -hmm. because she's not in it for the right reasons. He's not going to get a chance to showcase himself. It's time to move on. Not here to make friends. Well, Plash, no rose for you today. You might be the best free agent in showdown history. Um, Sarah Spain, no rose for you either. You're going the wrong way. Why are you taking two points away from Israel me? Israel Gutierrez, Clinton Yates will be our showdown. Happy New Year, Israel. I'm not sure if I can sleep. $1,000 pay rates. Mike Bobo of Colorado State did it because the Rams were 3-9 this past season. Israel, pro or con? <laughs> Definitely a con. I understand the gesture here, but turning down a 5-6% raise is going to get you what as a Colorado State head coach? Going to get that locker room motivated, man? Come on, bring that money You understand family. the gesture? I hope you're not related to this guy in any way or in his family. Not to mention, if you're a, a player of his, you're thinking, what are you, an idiot? I can't get money, you can, and you're turning it down? This makes so no sense. So you both think it's understand. a con. I thought it was a fine gesture. Yes. Sure, let's, I won't take a raise unless we win. Okay, fine. You're both losing a point. We'll move on. Showdown two, Clay Thompson, 43 points. Anyone want to guess on how many dribbles he scored those 43 points? Or cuatro. Okay, not much of a guess if you guys already know. We'll give you a point back. Four. At one point, by the way, he was blocked by a ghost and wanted a foul. Uh, so let's compare that. The four dribbles to score 43 or blocked by a ghost. What is more eye-raising to you, Clinton? To me, it's got to be the ghost block. It reminds me of those old video games where you get a glitch and the ball just goes flying out of the back and you have no idea what just happened. Clay was so confused. It was great. Look, this might not help me on this showdown, but he got fouled. There's an angle of the replay where you can see him getting fouled. Clay might be a little all over the place sometimes when he does interviews, but the man knows when uh, he gets fouled. I don't fouled. know. Do you have said angle of said replay at this moment? Do you want to do I mean, a I'm not a producer video show, daily so. double? Well, you could have choreographed it before we went on. We'll move on. Showdown three. Going to show you Williams Studios home run from the Caribbean game last night. This is Venezuela only. You have to tell me how many unwritten and how many written rules he broke. Israel, go ahead. 
I mean, the unwritten rules are through the roof here, but I want some of that here in the United States. He's a Minnesota Twins player. He's had almost 100 at-bats in the major leagues. He needs to keep doing that and bring that celebration up here. Yes, and if you want to see some of his most exciting plays, just Google him going from first to home last season. There's no unwritten rules broken here at all. He's a Venezuelan playing in Venezuela in the Winter Leagues. This is how they do it. It's great. This is how you do it in FaceTime, Clinton Yates, winning the first career matchup between the two. You own this matchup, Yates. <laughs> this Friday, the Washington Wizards broadcast partner are going to present a new format in which they show sports betting and live play situations on the side of the screen while you watch the game. Now listen, this is a slippery slope for a lot of folks. T Ted Leonsis said he wanted to open up the e-market when they decided to legalize sports betting. The truth is they probably just want to turn arenas into casinos, but be careful what you wish for, kiddos. It could get ugly. Linton Yates. That's Win number That's one over Israel Gutierrez, man. You always remember that. Good to do it, folks. 23 and a half hour break. Rival now.